So uh, thank you very much, though. We'll see whether you're applauded at the end or you're just dazed when you leave. Um, and thanks for the uh, intro, Frank. And uh, some of you might know uh, I had uh, several careers, uh, but the most relevant one here was I was a serial entrepreneur for 20-some uh, odd years. I did eight startups, ranging from two semiconductor companies, supercomputer company, video game company, um, on and on. While it's nice that four of them went public, I have to tell you the best thing that ever happened was I had two failures. Um, and they left craters so deep they had their own iridium layer. Um, the good news is because out of those fa failures came a ton of learning and experience. And I'm going to share with you tonight some of the things I learned and uh, maybe just leave you a lot of food for thought. Now, some of you might know in the last decade or so, I've been an educator. I do what I call drive-by teaching um, at Stanford in the engineering school, at UC Berkeley in the Haas Business School, and uh, join MBA with Columbia uh, here in New York, as well as a short course in Columbia. NYU has yet to get me, but Frank is working on that. Um, um, and uh, I teach a methodology uh, for early stage entrepreneurs called customer development. Now, when I first started teaching, uh, and I, this was kind of the intersection of entrepreneurship and academia, uh, they were interviewing me and said, well, can you at least draw your methodology? How do you intend to, to teach? And I said, well, what does that mean? They said, well, how does it kind of work for entrepreneurship? How are you going to teach entrepreneurship? I said, well, what do you mean diagram it out? They said, well, what's life like as an entrepreneur? And so the first diagram I kind of showed up with was uh, this. I kind of said, well, you know, entrepreneurs, the life of an entrepreneur, if you want a diagram, it kind of is like this. This is what, you know, life is like. And, <laughs> They said, Mr. Blank, uh, perhaps we ought to skip the diagram part and, you know, what course would you like to put together? Um, so I'm going to tell the story of some things that have occurred to me about entrepreneurship, how to do startups, and how to think about entrepreneurship in um, five short stories. Or some of them will seem longer to you than others. If you're bored, it's okay. Feel free to tweet, read your mail, etc. <laughs> Hashtag is SG Blank or I am bored, one of the two, either, <laughs> either one. But I have to tell you, the first time when I started teaching, I decided, hey, why don't I see how some of the other professors are teaching entrepreneurship? Because, gee, I knew what entrepreneurship was. I did it for 21 years. I knew it was all about having an idea, thinking you were going to take over the world, raising more money than, you know, like I'd ever dreamed of, and most of the time losing it, but every once in a while, like, making a lot of money. That's what entrepreneurship was about, and that's who entrepreneurs were, and that's what a startup was about. I have to tell you, after about two or three weeks sitting in different professors' classrooms, my head was spinning around because I realized my worldview of who an entrepreneur was and what a startup was wasn't shared by many people. In fact, it was a very Silicon Valley technology-centric view. And in fact, it not only confused me, it dawned on me that it confused entrepreneurs and confused government policymakers confuses regions thinking about entrepreneurship. So let me just start with what's a startup and who's an entrepreneur. And I'm hoping by the time I give this talk enough times around the world, everybody will have a taxonomy, if not like this, but at least one they could agree on. Now, I live near the coast of California. And we have some interesting neighbors, including some people who live to surf. I mean, that's their entire life. They can't think of anything better than to surf. Unfortunately, they need to make money, pay the rent, and buy food. So what they do is they have a little shack, little store, and it says, surfing lessons, 9 a.m. to 10.45. <laughs> and they'll teach search, surfing or until as long as they need to teach to make money. Then they'll make enough money and go out and surf. Now, a couple of interesting characteristics. They are entrepreneurs. They're working to live their passion. They are doing a startup. They are serving known customers with a known product, and they work for their passion. No one would confuse them with Google or Facebook or Foursquare, but they truly are entrepreneurs. And I will tell you that that's a category we should consider about entrepreneurs and startups, self-employed, Working for no one, serving a known market, known customers. Now, there's another set of entrepreneurs that we typically don't think about in Silicon Valley, 
but in fact are the majority of entrepreneurs in the United States. I'm going to get to those in a second, but there's one in between that. How many of you believe in social causes? How many of you are passionate about social causes? Well, there's a class of entrepreneur, sorry, called social entrepreneurs. Social entrepreneurs wake up in the morning, and how many of you who raised your hand want to change the universe? Okay. All right. You uh, kind of count as entrepreneurs because you're equally insane. Okay. <laughs> You've woken up and said, I could make a difference. I believe I can make something happen. I don't want to work for a large corporation. I want to make a change. And one or two things could happen. You could decide to make a whole new nonprofit to start something that's never been existed before. And actually, because you have an insight, change the world that way. Or you could decide that you want to make a for-profit company, but do the right thing. Seventh generation, right? The company that makes uh, uh, environmentally conscious soaps, electric car companies, etc. You could decide that you are going to make a for-profit company, but instead of optimizing profits, you're going to optimize the right thing. Those are social entrepreneurs. And by the way, you could probably get venture funded, but you're going to have to talk a lot harder and faster than traditional technology entrepreneurs. Because you're going to have convince people, at least for the company version of what you're building, that in changing the world, you at least can return a profit to your investors. Those are entrepreneurs. Those are startups. Those are typically not funded by technology venture investors. There are some exceptions, but that's not where you go raise money. There's another type of startups, small businesses. My parents were immigrants to the United States, came to New York in the middle of the 20th century, worked in the garment district for other people until they could raise enough money and open their dream. Their dream of the American success story was opening a grocery store on the Lower East Side. My parents were entrepreneurs. They did a startup. They were serving known customers with known products, local and ethnic foods, and their goal was not to take over the universe, but to feed the family. The exit criteria from them, from going from a startup to a small business, was did they find a business model? That is, did they find a set of products and goods and prices that would make it a profitable business? They built this with an existing team, which is a fancy way for saying both my parents worked and we, when we were old enough, we showed up too. And in their entire lives, entire lives, they brought in more than half a million dollars, I'm probably, probably exaggerating, by a couple hundred grand. That was their entire income. Now, they did a startup. They were entrepreneurs, and they weren't alone. It turns out in the United States today, there are 5.7 million small businesses in the US. It makes up 99.7% of all companies. 50% of all non-governmental workers are in small businesses. So when we talk about entrepreneurship outside of technology clusters, most likely people are thinking about small businesses grocery stores, electricians, carpenters, database consultants, UI designers, anybody not working for a large corporation who's building their own small company. Now, one of the interesting things about small businesses is that the type of capital they use, is the type of money they use to build their company is not venture capital. They cannot attract venture capital. The reason why is their returns aren't large enough for a venture capitalist to be interesting. So they raise money from friends, family, bank loans, small business administration, etc. Small businesses very different from technology businesses. And the technology businesses that we do in Silicon Valley and are emerging here in New York, been done in Boston, these are high growth startups. I call them scalable startups. And I call them scalable because from day one, from the day an entrepreneur had the idea, their goal 
is I am going to be a billion bucks. I'm going to take over the universe. And maybe they're not thinking about dollars, but they're certainly thinking about something world-changing. These aren't about small mobile iPhone apps. These are something fundamental, something that will change the way we work and live. There's probably one of these entrepreneurs every 30 seconds. And probably one failing every 29 seconds, but they're out there. Their goal is, is to so solve for unknown customers with unknown features, and their goal is to go from a scalable startup on the left and someday to become a large company. And they'll stop being a startup when they could find a business model, they find a market, potential customers of half a billion dollars or more, and that they figure out they could grow to, not 100, but 100 million dollars a year, and become a large company. Now, a scalable startup, in contrast to anything we've talked about before, is designed from day one to grow big. It has a vision. And it typically needs risk capital. Risk capital is a fancy way of describing a financial asset class that we typically call venture capital. But I call them the equally insane partners of technology entrepreneurs. Because if you think about it, venture capital is the only time where financial investors will say, I'm okay if 90% or more of my investments fail. I will make up all those failures with the 10% that succeed at least until the housing bubble. Then we probably said something else, but this is what Silicon Valley says and means when we say startup. We talk about scalable startups. Make sense? Now the last type of startup that fits in the technology space um, has emerged in the last couple of years, but let me point out one little thing about scalable startups that is not taught in any school and venture capitalists will never tell entrepreneurs. How many of you are entrepreneurs now? I'm going to show you the secret slide right here. Unlike going from scalable startup on the left, where you're searching for a business model, and being a large company where you execute one, there's a box in the middle. No one's ever drawn that box. It's called the transition, which is a polite term for where you build the company, but you fire the founders. This is where the founders depart. And this isn't something evil, it's just something that's not quite communicated openly. Because on the left, here you are, the entrepreneur, running around the country and the world trying to find a repeatable business model. And one day, you find it. You figure out who the customers are, you figure out you have the right product. People are now excited about buying your stuff. All of a sudden, sales are going great. And you have a board meeting, and you announce that. We nailed it. We figured it out. And you're standing there waiting for the parade. In fact, you brought confetti just in case they want to throw it for you. And you cleared the aisles for the parade. But instead, you notice your venture capitalists are staring at you for the first time in a way that's making you personally uncomfortable because they're <laughs> invading your space. Why are they doing that? Any idea? You might know. They're buying you. Well, they've already bought you. Time for you to sell. Any idea? Interesting. They know that you might not be the person to lead it to the next step. Until now, they were happy for you to do crazy things Whatever it took as an insane founder, 24-7, fly here, fly there, change the business model, you know, pivot, do all those right things you're supposed to. But now you've found a repeatable model. And all of a sudden, your startup, which was essentially worthless to the VCs, are now worth a lot of money. And what they want to ensure is are you the right person to take it to the next step to scale it? And the reality is most founders who are wonderful at operating in the chaotic regime actually don't do execution very well. 
And so this is when venture capitalists start muttering the word operating exec. Anybody ever hear that word? An operating exec is somebody who's dressed up in a suit, has a tie, and, and has gone to Harvard and has figured out you know, how to run a company. And venture capitalists traditionally have believed that those are the people who can best take the company from scalable startup into large company. Brings in professional management, process, and beginning of scale. Trust me, it doesn't always end like this uh, because the largest and most innovative technology companies are still run or were run by their founders. Think about that. But most of the time, VCs tend to calculate like this. Just keep that in mind. Uh, there's another type of technology startup. Silicon Valley and New York are big on these, just emerged in the last five years. And these are what I call viable startups. For lots of reasons, in the last five years, it's now possible to build an internet, web, mobile, or cloud app truly on your laptop. All the computing is done in Amazon Web Services. You could start the company on your credit card. Maybe you'll need a couple hundred grand, maybe more, but not much. All of a sudden, you no longer need traditional venture capital. There's a whole new class of funding called super angels who have now stepped into this space who are happy to fund internet mobile apps, cloud apps, web apps that only require a couple hundred thousand dollars to figure out whether there's a business here or not. And they're happy with an exit that's measured in five, 10, 50 million dollars. They're not interested in billion dollar scores. They're happy to take it but they're also happy if you get sold to Google or Facebook or Twitter or a New York media company. And it's great because you're only 23 years old and now you'll have money in the bank, you get to do it again. This truly has emerged through these series of intersections. Um, agile engineering, the ability to iterate and incrementally engineer all make this possible. So that's a, another type of technology startup. And your goal is to sell to a larger company. So what's a startup? Let me just point out that I'm finally going to give you a definition I think actually fits best. To me, a startup is a temporary organization designed to search for a repeatable and scalable business model. So that means a couple of things. Your goal is to go from that box on the left to the box on the right. Your goal is not to stay in the box on the left, as fun as it might be. Gee, there's beer and the Fridays and I bring my dog and it's kind of great and look at the cool offices and we're next to the restaurants, my friends, and let me just remind you, there's no such thing as a 10-year-old startup. There's a two-year-old startup attached to an eight-year-old failure. And if you're enjoying it too much, you're doing the wrong business. The goal of the startup is to go to the right, not to stay in the left. And so what are you looking for? You're searching. It's what entrepreneurs do great. Even though you think you're building the app or you know, trying to get cut, you're searching. What are you searching for? A repeatable and scalable business model. And that's what we're going to explain in the rest of the conversation. Let me just uh, uh, mention, large companies also innovate. 15 years ago, a professor at Harvard, Clinton Christensen, talked about the two types of innovation large corporations do. Sustaining innovation, disruptive innovation. Christensen said, look, large companies are excellent about innovating around their core business. They know how to make things cheaper and better and faster and adjacent markets. That's what they're great at. In fact, two best companies for sustaining innovation in the world were called Nokia and RIM. They could make those phones cheaper and in colors and work on different cell systems, and every year the thinner and the screens were better. They were great at sustaining innovation. The problem is, is that companies no longer control their own destinies. They could be disrupted by outside activities. Anybody know what kind of outside things can disrupt a company's business? Anybody know? New technology, that's easy, right? Somebody invents anti-gravity, that kind of makes it tough for the airline's business. What, what's another example? Technology is good. Legislation. Legislation. Government deregulates a market, where all of a sudden AT&T used to own everything, now all of a sudden they had to compete in an open market. What else? Cost. 
declining costs. Now all of a sudden you could build things in China. Holy cow. Ask all the unemployed in the United States what happened to global, with globalization, declining costs. What else? Limited resources. We went out of uh, raw materials or something, and now it's a, it's a different game. Anything else? What else can disrupt? New business models. Somebody could say, well, what if we did this or this customer segment was different? A anything else? Yes? Taking out the middleman. Uh, new channels of distribution. <coughs> All of these things add to disruption. And if you're a large company who's been great at sustaining innovation, this is a slap on the back of the head by a two by four. Because you will act like you never saw it coming. It's called disruptive innovation. It means all of a sudden you need to deal with new markets, with new technology, new customers, new channel. What happened to Nokia and RIM? They did the world's best sustaining innovation. They were disrupted by a set of crazy people from Cupertino who said we have a very different model of what people want to carry in their hands to communicate. We believe it's not just voice, and we believe it's not just text. We believe it's going to be all those things plus the internet plus applications. <clears throat> and the iPhone completely disrupted very smart companies sustaining innovation and now forces companies to act like startups. And how you deal with disruptive innovation in a large company is you need to act like a startup. You need to either build competing products, you need to partner with people, that's what Nokia is trying to do, or you need to acquire startups. That's what Google and Facebook do. Google and Facebook acquire a ton of IP, intellectual property, but they also acquire teams. I don't know if most of you know, but the Android phones some of you carry were not developed at Google at all but they were an acquisition of Google, and the head of that company basically made it a big chunk of Google's business. So large companies deal with disruption in multiple ways. So I wanted to give you guys a, just kind of a view of uh, who's a startup and who's an entrepreneur, and the reason why is before you do a startup, I'd mentally go through the checklist. Who are we? What do we want to accomplish? Are we shooting for the moon with a billion dollar company, billion dollar vision? Do I want to do a viable startup? Or am I kind of like happy to do kind of a lifestyle business? There is no right answer. But the only answer is if you're in partnership with anybody, you all better have the same answer. And more importantly, if you take money from somebody, you and your investors ought to be in sync. Because it's not pretty when you have this conversation post investment. Make sense? All right. Um, the other thing I wanted to share with you is the difference between startups and companies. And so I used kind of large companies in the example of entrepreneurship. Um, you might have noticed, though, I will re refund anybody's uh, uh, fee for getting in if, uh, oh, it was free? Oh, <laughs> that's why I'll refund it if there are any accountants who are doing startups. But um, what I'm about to explain is why accountants don't run startups. It turns out startups and large companies are not different just in size but are fundamentally different in what they do. For example, if you're in a startup, as I said earlier, your goal is to search for a business model. And keep that phrase in mind, because I'm going to explain what it is a little later. But your goal is to search. You're looking for the fit between your product and a market, a series of customers. You might think your startup is all about your idea, but you're going to find out very quickly that your idea, your technology, or your service is just one small piece of what you're going to bring to the game. Just because you have a good idea, congratulations, you and everybody in your dorm and at NYU and in New York has an idea. It's how you turn that into a company. And what you're going to try to find is the fit between your idea, your technology, and enough customers, and whether you could repeat that enough to make a business. And so that's what you're doing as a startup. You're searching. Here's a series of unknowns. This is a risky journey you're about to encounter. In contrast, if you're in a large company or about to become one, you have found this business model. You're no longer a startup when you've hit cash flow break even. You're heading to profitability. You have scale. You're about to hit senior management. We're about to hire senior management. You cross the magic 150 number. Anybody know what the magic number is called? Dunbar's number, of course. Turns out human beings are wired 
not to recognize more than 150 people. Turns out 150 people, you typically need to divisionalize, get a new building or something. Most people literally cannot recognize more than 150 faces. Now, for me, that number is about three. I won't <laughs> tell you what I did when I was a youth, but um, my memory is not very good for many things. Um, uh, but after reading Steve Jobs' bio, I feel like I was right at home. Um, <laughs> But 150 people is kind of the magic. It's becoming a company number. And instead of search, you're about execution. Large companies execute. By execution, I mean we're not searching. We're not doing something different from Monday to Tuesday to Wednesday. If you work in a large company, you have a job spec. You have a job. Somebody has figured out what that job means. You're doing that every day. You are executing. But... Also in a large company, you're doing accounting. If you want to do finance, anybody take any accounting classes yet? Anybody know about accounting? That's it? Come on, there must be more accountants in here. Yes, sir. It's all right. Uh, in a large company, unless you know balance sheet, income statement, and cash flow, you really can't be running or a divisional general manager. You need to keep track of profit and loss. You need to know about how the company's finances are doing. Now, I have to tell you something funny. For 20 years, well, I did startups. Our first, first board meeting. My venture capitalist would, you know, want to hear a status report from me as the CEO. So what's the first thing they ask for? They ask for a balance sheet, cash flow, and income statement. Okay. What do you think my revenue was as I pushed my perfectly formatted papers across the table month one? What, a, what is it? Zero. Zero. What a surprise. But boy, was that spreadsheet formatted. It was good. The fonts looked good. It was an illegal sized paper. They told me where to staple it correctly and you know how the columns needed to line up. Month two, revenue zero. Month three, zero. But boy, they wanted those reports, and that was the first thing we discussed. Oh, yes, look at that. Now, I did this for 20 years. But the irony is not only was I doing this for 20 years, they were asking not only me, but thousands, tens of thousands of startups in Silicon Valley that that's the first set of documents we want to look at. Now, I don't know about you, but that's the most absurd thing I've ever heard. That nowadays, when I advise both VCs and startups, I go, if anybody asks for, you, for that as the first thing, walk out of the board meeting. Because it means your investors have no idea how to provide value in the first year. In the first year, you should be worrying about startup metrics, how to measure how your search is going. The only like income statement, balance sheet, cash flow numbers I need to know is what's your burn rate and how much do you have left in the bank. And after that, it's advanced math. Right? That's all I need to know. But I want to know how are you doing in searching for your business. This happens to be some examples for a web startup, but you'll come up with your own metrics for your own startups. Customer acquisition cost, viral coefficient, lifetime value, average selling price, burn rate, et cetera. I want to understand, is my board helping me understand my business model, not am I providing paperwork for them to manage theirs? Yes, question. Ah, tech support, please. You know, it, it, there's, a, there's an innovative and creative solution if you actually move to a seat in the middle. <laughs> yeah? Yeah? There's plenty of these seats here, but no, seriously, the better seats are here, you get a higher grade here. It's, uh, so you're more than welcome to these. Uh, these are the high price seats we won't charge anymore, but we'll see if Frank could uh, do this. Um, um, so in any case, this is what you do when you're searching. Startups, excuse me, large companies, sales. Has anybody ever met a VP of sales of a Fortune 100 company. Anybody ever seen one? How tall were they? Yeah, 6'1". Minimum height requirement, by the way. No, no, no. If it's a white guy in America, 6'1 to 6'4", silver hair, right? And looked like they just got done with a golf course, because they just did. They have a great... You know? And, no, because people are going, well, yes, that's my father. I know him. Um, and that's no joke. That's exactly what they need to, that is large company VPs of sales know how to manage and hire sales organizations. Earlier in their career, they might have known how to sell, but now they're interested in building scalable 
sales forces, their job is to make or exceed the plan. And they do that through managing people, and they hire people who know how to sell from price lists and data sheets and sell sheets. They know how to execute an existing model. Now, one of the things, my fantasy, in my entire career was to be able to hire one of these people. Because I believe there was something magic about them. If they were able to make $100 million a year at IBM, they ought to at least be able to have my first year's revenue at 10 to $20 million. It's that simple. They were great there, they ought to be great here. And unfortunately, I got my wish in my last startup. I was able to hire a senior director of sales from Oracle, who you know, was in the top 1% club, got to go to the moon or wherever they went for you know, the top 100 club. I don't know, it was just really impressive. I mean, great resume, talked great. Wonderful guy. So within the first month at our startup, we're now making sales calls. It's a rainy winter, and we were just thrown out of our fifth meeting in a row. In fact, we didn't even get past slide six, and they said, thank you. Whoa, what was that? You know, little, little did I know that the slide equivalently said, screw you and your, you know, the horse you rode in on, but that was you know, when I finally understood that you should not tell a CIO that their job doesn't matter, but that's another story. So we're sitting in the car, and I'm just like, oh, what happened here? And Jay, my great VP of sales, says, Steve, you don't understand. This is why you hired me. World-class salespeople this rolls right off our back. And he put the key in the ignition. I said, gee, where are you going? He said, didn't you just hear me? We're just going to make some more sales calls. Right then, right then, I loved Jay and realized I need to fire him. <laughs> Seriously, because what happened next was instructed. He starts driving, and I pull out my computer. And I start typing. He says, what are you doing? I said, well, Jay, the presentation and our strategy is clearly not working. We need to try something different. And the car almost went off the road. You can't do that. Well, why not? I memorized that presentation. <laughs> Seriously, I memorized the presentation. In a startup, it's not about selling off the price list and data sheet and whatever. It's all about, excuse me, it's all about early adopters and understanding that everything you've written down is simply a hypothesis, that you're testing and iterating, and it's not yet repeatable. But here's the killer for startups. Took me a long time to realize this. The titles are identical between a large company and a startup. They have VP of sales, you have VP of sales. They have head of marketing, you have head of marketing. They have head of biz dev, you have head of biz dev. But the job spec underneath for the first year or two of a startup is night and day. And not understanding the distinction between those specs will put your early stage venture right out of business. Because if you're as lucky as I will, was and hire the quote right person, they will just drive you off the cliff. Not because out of malice or not even lack of competence, but they will try to replicate what they did in the large company. And you are trying to do something very different. Just keep that in mind, right? Next thing is engineering. Large corporations, they get handed a Market requirements document historically went into something called waterfall development, meaning here are, the do here are the requirements, let's start engineering, I'll let you know when it's done. Had a QA department, quality assurance and tech technical publications that wrote the manuals. Perfect for a large corporation. If any of you in a startup are doing any of this stuff, you ought to be staring at your partner going, uh-oh. And in fact, some of you ought to be tweeting, fire QA and tech pops. Because that's not what startups do. Startups do agile engineering, agile development. Startups are doing incremental and iterative engineering. We're no longer specking the whole product because we now know something that's taken us 40 years of hard learning to, to, to know. What we know is 80 to 90% of the features you engineer in waterfall development are unused or unwanted by customers. Whoa. That means 80 to 90% of all your work from engineering is garbage. So why do all that until you figure out which are the things customers want? We now have an engineering methodology that would allow us to do that. Startups do agile development. 
continuous deployment, continuous learning, self-organizing teams, minimum feature sets, and pivots, and we'll explain this later. The last piece is large companies write business plans. Business plans are great in large corporations. Business plans are perfect in describing the next series of products. Here's our adjacent market, or here's why this product will be cheaper or faster or better. That's perfect, because you know the customers. You know the markets. You know the business model. A business plan makes all the sense in the world for a large corporation. In this slide, I'll just be polite and say, startups don't do business plans. Startups do business models. Startups understand that you're dealing with unknown customer needs and feature sets and business models, and you're not going to find it in a document you will write. You will find it by iteration. And that brings us to our next point, business plan versus business model. It took me a long time to understand what was wrong with a business plan. Because I thought you just put a nice cover on it, you research it a lot, you know, you get the market size and total available market, you sit in the library a lot, you talk to your friends, and you might even talk to a couple of people in the dorm, and hey, again, computers are great, I use the right font, there's a couple of great pie charts in here, and what, you wait till you see that Excel spreadsheet in the back. Right? Anybody ever write a business plan? Yeah. I'm going to tell you the bad news. No business plan survives first contact with customers, period. Any of you who have ever done a startup and written a plan, this is a fact, incontrovertible. In fact, every year I have a series of students who want to buy me coffee. Professor Blank, it's about my business plan. Well, you didn't learn that in my class. No, it was the class after you. Okay, you know, we have coffee. Well, what's the problem? Well, you know, we took your class, but then we took the how to write a business plan class. Well, what did you do? Well, we started the company. Well, what did you do? Well, we raised money. Okay, we built the product, right? Well, what's happening? Well, the customers aren't responding like the business plan said. <laughs> well, then I always suggest, well, why don't you just wrap a copy of the business plan around the product? And they take a note, wrap business, <laughs> and I go, no, 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 you guys are just wrong. Just wrong. It doesn't work this way. Startups fail and business plans fail because you confuse the fact that you should be searching while a business plan tells you what you should be executing. There's no possible way, no possible way for you to have pre-guessed all the things that are going to happen to you in a plan. It might be a nice internal document of who's the team and what they're going to do, but for you to think that that's some prediction of the future is just insane. So the goal is to search for a business model, and I've been using this word a lot, so what is this? It turns out a friend of mine, Alexander Osterwalder, has written a book called Business Model Generation. Now, any of you have it? Okay, all of you should have it. Okay, yeah, Truly, if you want to do entrepreneurship, I get no royalties, but I love Alexander. I use his stuff in my class. He basically said, look, you got three professors in a room and you could get 12 definitions of what a business model is, so I'm going to add one more. But I kind of like his because it uses pictures. And I can understand pictures, so I'll show you his pictures. Osterwalder has this funny thesis. He says, any company, I could describe any company from a startup to the world's largest corporation in nine boxes. And here's what they are. Who are your customers? Who are your customers? You have a startup? You must have somebody in mind you're selling this stuff to, or your service, or you're filling a need. Who's it for? And more importantly, what do they really want you to get done? Is it to solve a return on investment problem, or is it to satisfy a need like a video game, or a social network, or something else? What do they want you to get done? Write them down. Write down who you think they are. Next is, what are you building for them? And because Alexander was an academic, he used a great $10 word called value propositions. But it really means, what's the product or service you're building for these customers? What is it? And why will they love it? And why will they care? The next is, what's called channel? What's the sales channel that the product will get from you to the customer? Will you hire a direct sales force? Will you have telemarketing people? Will they come just to your website? You're going to be selling the product over the web? What's the sales channel? And by the way, how are they going to hear about you? Another $10 word, customer relationships. 
It just means, how do you get them to know that you exist? How do you drive customers into your sales channel? And then finally, the other key piece is, how much are you going to price and who's going to pay you? By the way, anybody use Google? <laughs> yeah. All right. How much do you pay for Google? You use Google for free? They're the most profitable company in the world in search. Anybody else pay for Google? No? Wait a minute. So anybody pay for searching on Google? Nobody? Well, how does Google make money? Ads. Well, that's interesting. So you see what when you use Google as a user? What product do you see? What do you use? The search results. See a search bar in either your toolbar or google.com. But somebody mentioned ads. What product, anybody buy Google ads in this room? Anybody? What product do you see? But when you buy the ads, what do you see? Yeah, what's it called? Google AdWords. So, big idea. Google has two products in search. They have the search bar, which does search, and they have Google AdWords. We also now know Google has two revenue models. For users, it's zero. For payers, how do they price? What's their pricing model? Pay-per-click, right? Or pay-per-click, pay right? And by the way, different channels, right? Google does almost no advertising for users, but you bet they do demand creation to get advertisers. Now, this is called a multi-sided market. Some businesses, predominantly on the web, create users and then sell those users. You didn't know you were a product, right? They're selling you to advertisers. Pretty 21st century model, huh? Pretty cool. So you think about radio in the 1920s, right? Millions of listeners, few advertisers. Television, millions of viewers, a couple of advertisers. Multi-sided markets like this were broadcast. Newspapers, same way. Millions of readers, though some of them weren't free newspapers, you actually got them to pay, but thousands of advertisers. Different businesses might have single-sided or multi-sided markets. Kind of interesting, huh? The other things to think about is, what resources do you need? Do you need engineers? Do you need raw materials? What, if anything, do you need for your business? Do you need IP or patents you're going to sell? And what activities do you need to do? Do you need low-cost manufacturing in China? Do you need to put together a low-cost data center? And do you need to have any partners? My favorite partner strategy was, again, Apple and the iPhone, excuse me, and the iPod. If you remember, everybody had hardware players that could play digital music. Yeah, Apple added a disk drive, and it was unique, and they added iTunes, which was some software. But no one owned the content. The record labels owned the content. Steve Jobs had an insight. If he could get, get the record labels to license the content to Apple, and they could sell songs for 99 cents, that would change Apple's lock on the market, make them unique. So Steve Jobs went to the record labels, who are the toughest negotiators on the planet, and said, give me all your content. And they laughed hysterically. <laughs> and then he came back again and said, give me all your content. <laughs> and the third time he said it, the next thing you knew, the guy was sitting in his underwear, and all the money from the record labels had disappeared and went to Apple, because he had convinced them to essentially give away their content, and it wasn't until a year or two later that they realized that their partnership deal with Apple made Apple actually the leading provider of profits, not the record labels. Kind of an amazing story. Probably only somebody with a reality distortion field of jobs could have pulled it off. But all of you should be thinking about when you're architecting business models, is there some unfair advantage in any of these boxes you could think about? And by the way, this side adds up to what's your expense model. Now, this is what's called a business model canvas. You fill it all out, and then you could sketch it out. Now, what's nice is that this is a great exercise for a university or a large corporate boardroom, and this is great. It's wonderful theory. You get to think a lot. The problem is, even when you're done, 
they're still hypotheses. And by the way, I use hypotheses when I'm in a university because you pay a lot of money to go to school. But outside of school, you know what the real word of a hypothesis is? What's it really called? Guess. And I use an adjective in front of it, but I won't use it here. You're just guessing. Though this is a great exercise, the problem is, is you're still left with a bunch of guesses ab about your building. And so customer development is the search for the, build, for the business model. And there's a phrase that I've used that I've taught generations of entrepreneurs. There are no facts inside your building, so get the hell out. I don't care who has an opinion about the business model. You're all right. Doesn't matter. We make meetings really short. You got a hypothesis, I got a hypothesis. In fact, the game I used to play when we started arguing was, oh, really, we disagree? Everybody pull out your business card. What? Pull out your business cards. OK, mine says CEO. Anybody got a better business card? No? OK, my hypothesis wins. First one, first one with a fact. First one with a fact. I don't care who it is. My admin, my mailman, doesn't matter. Trump's my opinion. But it makes meetings really short, or else you're just arguing about who has a better opinion. I want to hear some facts. And because remember, more startups, even in Silicon Valley, the heart of technology innovation in now New York as well, you would think would fail from that the technology failed. It turns out more of them failed because they didn't find enough customers. Not that the technology was, didn't work, though I've yet to see any delivered on time. That's my thing to engineering. Um, but it's not that technology fails. So what we came up with is this customer development process. The customer development process is a four-step process for testing your business model. It's a pretty rigorous process. And it starts with something called customer discovery, where we're going to test your hypotheses. Customer validation, we're going to try to get some early orders. Customer creation, where we're going to try to scale. And company building, where we turn the startup into a company. Customer discovery has a couple of key ideas. One, it says you don't sell, you start listening to customers. And this is really hard for an entrepreneur, because Hey, it's my vision. I want to tell you all about my vision. And if, I, if I'm done telling you enough, if you don't believe it, I'll tell you some more. And then if you don't even believe it, I'll tell you some more again until you don't invite me to any more parties. Um, have you ever been that passionate as an entrepreneur? Yeah, right? Um, seriously, don't let go of that. But there ought to be 10 neurons, just 10, not a million, but 10 neurons whispering in your head, what if you're wrong? What if you're wrong? How do you know? Well, I'm right. God is coming down. Oh, he didn't? Well, if you didn't see the burning bush, you might want to have some process to kind of test this. And the hypotheses you want to test, and I'll show you a more detailed list, but the two ones that are essential, which are implicit in any entrepreneur's vision, is do you really understand the customer problem? Because when you have a vision as an entrepreneur, you say, hey, let's go build X. Why? Because I know people need X. Implicit in that statement is you understand what problems customer has. OK, if you do, let's just go out and spend 10 minutes. Just humor me. Let's go out and talk to some of those people who you absolutely believe have this problem. It's going to be the worst day of your life. Because you're going to go, but I'm sure those people exist. And then, if they do exist, we're going to test your solution. Not the entire product, we're just going to test the idea of your solution. Or maybe on the web we'll throw together a wireframe and test it. And this is a continuous discovery process. Now, discovery, as I said, some of the things you're going to test in this stage is who's the customer and what's their problem. Next is you're going to be asking, what is it the product or service that I'm making and does it solve this problem that people have told me they had? Many times you'll go out, and if you're doing this process well, you'll find out that, yeah, you actually did identify a problem that people have. And if you ask them, they'd say, it's absolutely number 48 on my list. Really? Yeah, on a good day, it might be 34. Well, how many do you pay for it, the top three? Well, if you're smart, you'll say, so what are the top three? Well, they're this, this, and this. And you go, oh, well, we do that. <laughs> Well, what is it you do? Well, what is it you need? 
<laughs> Trust me, great entrepreneurs are wonderful at that. Doesn't mean you have to give up your vision, but you need to understand when you talk to customers, what is it that's important to them? Now, sometimes you might be so far ahead in a new market that they might not even understand what you're building. And getting that data is equally valid. As long as you come back and can tell yourself, your co-founders and your partners, we're inventing the future. We see it, this is what it looks like. We need to make sure you're with us as investors and as founders, because this is the future we're betting on. That's an equally valid proposition, but you can't just use that as a cop-out by staying in your building saying, well, no one will get it, it's still far ahead. I want you to hear what people will say to still tell me that you're still on the path for the future. How big is this market? This is the only real business plan -y stuff I like. Do a back of the envelope, tell me that you've at least thought about how many possible people could use your product or service or game or whatever, and what will it take? Will something have to change for them to be able to do that? How do you create demand? How do you deliver the product? And ultimately, how do you make money? The other step is customer validation. Customer validation says, okay, I've learned about the problem, the solution, I've discovered all this stuff. Steve, you wouldn't let me talk about the product, but now I'm ready to go do that. Let's see if I could find a repeatable and scalable business model. And this is a fancy way to say, I want to get some orders now, either on my website or for a physical product I haven't completed yet. I want to start selling before the product is finished. Now, who's crazy enough to buy an unfinished, untested, buggy product? Probably about a quarter of you in the room would. These are early evangelists. People who are early adopters, internal evangelists and companies, these are people who love to be first, either because of culture or inside a corporation, because they want a competitive advantage. They exist in any and every market. You need to find these early customers. They will prove to you whether there's a business here or not. And if you can't find any of them, this is one of the exciting things about how we now do startups. It's this word pivot. It's this arrow that heads back. The pivot says, this is the heart of customer development. It allows us to do iteration without crisis. And what I mean by that is in the old days, a startup would work as follows. You'd write a business plan, you'd hand the plan to your VCs, they'd look at Appendix A, it says 100 million in five years, there's your revenue plan, you'd go into engineering for 18 months, engineer the product, go to first customer ship, have a big announcement, then you'd have your first board meet. And if you did a good job, everybody would be high-fiving each other. Great marketing, great press, great blogging, great whatever, engineering's happy, release one is out, then you have the next boarding meeting, six weeks later. So the marketing stuff is done. Board turns to the VP of sales, who's sitting there smiling. And they ask her, how are we doing per plan? And instead of answering the question directly, she goes, great pipeline. Now, you ought to know that the pipeline is not the same as revenue. Pipeline means I might have lots of interest, I might have something, but I really have no orders. Next board meeting, six weeks later, they ask her again, how are we doing on revenue? And she goes, wow, we have a really exciting pipeline. We got lots of people interested, blah, blah, blah. Now this might go on, depending on the economy, one or n more board meetings. Until the next to last board meeting, when she says this, the board who must go to school for this cocks their head at about a 15 degree angle, looks at the CEO and arches one eyebrow. And the CEO is also going to school for this, knows she's screwed. Because the next board meeting, you open the door and you notice two things. One is no one is sitting next to the VP of sales. And two is the stench of death is already in the room. And the minute they ask, how's the, board, how's the revenue? I don't know how they pull it off, but there's a puff of smoke and she disappears into ashes. <laughs> now, this had, some of you might have noticed this, this happened every 19 minutes in Silicon Valley. And what would happen next is almost per plan. You'd hire a new VP of sales. This time, this guy's not stupid. He'd look at the last strategy and go, well, she was an idiot. I have a better idea. 
and he would pivot or change the strategy. Now, six months later, if that's not working, instead of updating his re re resume, he's figuring out how to blame the VP of marketing, and who, by the way, is the next one to get fired in a startup. Then after that, depending on how much money the company has, you fire the CEO. Now, each one of these organizational changes required a crisis and required removing an executive and burning a ton of cash. We now realize after 40 years that this is insane. Why? Because we were assuming that startups are supposed to execute per plan. We now know that is not how startups work. Startups go from failure to failure, iterating and pivoting and changing their strategy as they learn from each mistake. The biggest mistake we were making is staffing and hiring as per success, as we would succeed, thinking we were just going to succeed. The reality was much different. We were going to fail. We needed a process in place that allowed us to learn incrementally and iteratively. And therefore, the pivot is the heart of this process. And how fast we pivot, how fast we learn and change our business model is what reduces our cash needs and something called the minimum feature set I'll talk about it in a second, speeds up the cycle. The last piece of this customer development, is, uh, the minimum feature set, it basically says, unlike the old days, there is no way we're letting you build the entire product as per your vision on day one. You need to build the minimum product to get some reaction from customers. Is it a wireframe website? Is it a physical demo? Is it a prototype? Is it, some, is it just a paper spec that elicits feedback? And then we will let you build more and more as you could make the case for why you need this. Now, this is all great theory, but if we have five more minutes, can I show you a real world example? Do you, have, do you guys have time? So this is nice. I was talking about this theory for a couple of years. I wrote a book, Four Steps to the Epiphany, blah, blah, blah. But finally, in the last year or two, I put this together in a class that's now taught at Stanford, taught at Berkeley, um, taught at Columbia, and was just adopted by the National Science Foundation as the standard for teaching entrepreneurship to scientists and engineers. It goes as follows. It's called the Lean Launchpad, Launchpad class. And here was an example. We had some engineers. Any of you engineers in the room? Any engineers? Oh, you could admit it. It's OK. Um, <laughs> these were real rocket scientists. These guys were machine vision experts. They knew how to get computers to identify objects better than anybody. And they decided to take the class because God knows why, but as a team, they decided the most exciting thing they could do is build a robotic lawnmower. Now, you, right, you would know they were engineers immediately because this was not the most exciting thing I could do if I could identify things. I just would not come up with it. But they were going to take a John Deere mower and you know, strip out the, the people and just say, we can mow anything. I went, OK, this is really? Your parents sent you to Stanford for this? All right. Um, <laughs> Let's go figure this out. And so their initial plan, these are their slides, by the way, their final deck, eight weeks. It's eight weeks, and they're engineers. They were going to make an autonomous, large-scale mowing and weeding machine. And they kind of had weeding in there, but their heart really was in this mower. And they wanted to build something that looked like a Mars rover. I mean, um, and so the first two weeks, first two weeks, how this class works, this customer development part, we made them draw their business model canvas, which I'll show you in a second. But then we threw them and all the other teams out of the building. We said, that's great, wonderful hypothesis. Go out and talk to people. So they talked to 20 customers. They interviewed golf course owners. They interviewed people who had to maintain parks and uh, landscaping services. And they also visited a couple of farms in the Salinas Valley near Stanford, thinking that maybe, yeah, somebody might be interested in a weeding machine. But really, most people will obviously want this for mowing. But they actually got their hands dirty and went out to the field. And this was their first business model canvas. They were going to make you know, an asset sale. They were going to sell physical equipment. And they were going to do mowing. And they were going to reduce operating costs. And you could see how they used the canvas to kind of state all their hypotheses. This is how you use the canvas. You kind of write down all your key ideas. And they said, see, this is great. We're done. And they actually went out. And they started talking to people, and they discovered, oh, you know this weeding problem? This is really a bigger problem than mowing. 
Because for organic farms in California, they use crews of hundreds or thousands of people to hand pick the weeds. And the farmer started telling them, hey, if you guys could identify weeds and kill them, that's a billion dollar business. And they said, say that number again. <laughs> and they went, billion dollar business. So now they were faced with a choice. Do we go after mowing or weeding for the class? And we said, no, nah, you do whatever you want. But you're being an idiot not to do weeding, but OK. <laughs> and they went, oh, weeding. We're going to do weeding. <laughs> so they changed their canvas. Big idea. Everything in red is a pivot. Everything in red said, we've now changed our business model. You know what the cost was? Zero. Right? Cost was zero. They just got out, talked to more people, and said, this is our new canvas. We're now working on the premise of our value prop is 100 to 1 labor reduction. You notice it's not about machine vision or technology. It's about what value they're bringing to their new customers, vegetable growers. Now, one of the interesting things is they were feeling kind of cocky. This is week three out of eight. And they said, see, we're doing great. We're doing wonderful in the class. We're feeling wonderful. And I said, well, where's the robot? I said, Professor Black, you can't build a robot in a year. I said, really? You guys are machine vision experts? Well, yes, of course. We're some of the best experts in the world. We're, you know, blah, blah, blah. I said, have you, how long have you guys been at Stanford? Oh, we've been here six years. Boom. I said, have you ever seen a B before? A B, the letter B. They said, what? I said, a grade of B. Have you guys ever seen a B? <laughs> well, we can't build the robot, and it would take us six months. I said, well, that's just gone 50% of the time since our conversation started. I want one by next week. That's impossible. We're going to drop the class. There's no way we could develop anything in a week. I said, B. And in fact, if you drop, F. <laughs> one week, one carrot bot. 100 hours, no sleep. And next week, it was out in the field as a machine vision data collection platform. So they built a, you know, didn't have a motor, but they drug it around the field. They started collecting. Um, can they tell the difference between weeds and carrots, laser line sweepers and coders, onboard data acquisition and power? And they actually had planned to put a high power DARPA uh, excess laser on it before I said, you're going to kill a farm worker. And I don't want, <laughs> because they were going to say, see, and then we could kill the weed. No, 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 we'll take your word for it right now. So this was CarrotBot version 1.0. And they updated the business model canvas. They now started thinking maybe we don't have to sell the equipment, we could lease it. And they started becoming experts. They were showing us pictures of weeds versus you know, carrots. Uh, they were taking farm pictures, organic broccoli. I was now learning more about vegetables than I ever cared. Um, they found their competition you know, was this the ugly chemical machine. They were writing down, we make them draw, draw who your customer was and what was it, what did you think it was versus what did they find. Here's their new friends. you know. Cliff, the farm manager and the equipment operator, and there's Justin, their buddy, and you know, here's Marty and you know, Doug, and they're on first name basis with these farmers, and you know, they're coming into class with hay in their, you know, in their mouth. It's actually quite a cute. They're updating their canvas. Um, and it turns out, just in the middle of this class, the World Agricultural Expo, in California, biggest ag expo in the country, because California actually does a lot, of, uh, a lot of crops. And all of a sudden, they're in the middle of this conference, interviewing more people than they could ever get their hands on. And they're now the hot stars of this conference with just this little carrot bot. And so finally, they have their final canvas. And here's what's interesting. Their revenue stream, their business model, farmers taught them to maximize their revenue. Why don't you go charge us for the density of the weeds and sell it to us as a service? Never would have figured that out as a classroom. Why don't you sell it to mid to large organic farmers? And why don't you just sell it as a cost reduction and eliminate labor problem? These guys were so excited about this that they not only did the project in the class, but after they left Stanford, they went out and raised money, and they're now a funded company. So here's one example of a team that uh, could do that. So um, let me just close with a couple slides. This was just an example. Um, and by the way, we teach it in engineering schools, teach the same class in business school, um, and teach it for the National Science Foundation. Here's why startups really aren't run by accountants. Anybody recognize this guy by any chance? Anybody know this name, Alfred P. Sloan? Anybody, who, who is it? GM. GM. Who in GM? He was the founder, right? 
Founder GM, 1920s, 1960s, wrong, but close. He was the president and chairman of General Motors. He basically invented essentially the modern corporation in the 20th century. No joke. This is the guy. Kind of looks like an accountant, doesn't he? I mean, is this the most? <laughs> Whoa. Anybody want to go party with this guy? <laughs> you know, MIT Sloan School was named after him. Sloan Foundation in New York, Sloan Kettering Institute named after him. Kettering was his VP of engineering at General Motors. Truly built GM into the canonical best run corporation of the 20th century. The problem was he wasn't the founder. This guy was the founder. Doesn't this guy look like he came out of the village? Right? He looked like you took the picture last night. Here's a name you should never forget. Billy Durant. Durant was the founder of General Motors. Durant was a crazed entrepreneur. He ran and owned the largest buggy manufacturer in Flint, Michigan in the 1890s. One day, he's sitting at the bar with his other buggy friends, and they hear this noise coming down the street. And horses are running in front of it, I mean, crazed, and it's the loudest thing they ever heard, and it was coughing and barking. It's the first two-cylinder automobile in Flint. His friends are hysterical. Just, look at this thing, transportation? Ha, ha, ha. And they look around, and Durant is gone. Next week, he sold off the entire buggy business. Sold his entire holdings, buggy manufacturing. And for the next 10 years, because he wasn't a technologist, but he was a great entrepreneur, he started acquiring the highest tech companies of his time. He started buying up automobile companies and put together a brand called General Motors. Durant runs the company to 1910, and then he's fired by his board. His board throws him out, crazy entrepreneur, get out of here. Durant is so angry, he finds another technology entrepreneur named Louis Chevrolet. Builds Chevrolet into a public company larger than General Motors, buys up all the GM stock, and fires his board. <laughs> runs GM for another 10 years to the 1920s until in today's dollars, it was 3.4 billion bucks. But Durant was still a crazed, uncontrollable entrepreneur, runs into his board again, this time run by the DuPonts, who throw him out for the final and last time. Sloan is appointed president in the 20th century and great management and GM was known as Sloan's company. No one hears from Durant. Durant versus Sloan. Sloan dies rich, honored, and famous. The 20th century, most famous businessman of the century. Durant dies penniless managing a bowling alley. Lessons for today? This is the accountant, but you are here. So, thank you very much. <laughs>